This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and Simon Slater. It is our 53rd episode, which means it's our, I guess, one-year anniversary. And what a year it has been. And, and, and one reason why the audio is like this is because things have regressed, and they seem to continue to regress, uh, as no one suddenly believes in science or reality or anything. So I guess we're kind of here for a little while. Uh, no, uh, no, it, it has progressed because we couldn't have been doing this remotely a couple of months ago. Oh, the good point. That has regressed is your capabilities because you're working on windows in a vacation Better house point. in Massachusetts. Well, you know, sometimes when you're high class, you create problems. So <laughs> <laughs> cut the nonsense. Let's go back to the beginning of this. I cannot remember why we actually all went out to Los Angeles at the same time. I do. To record this. So what, what actually brought us out? Because our first episode was Kittenativadad, which we recorded in L.A. But why were we out there, Tim? Because uh, Retrovirus was going to be on hiatus indefinitely. And I, you know, historically, you know, musicians, if you're living in a city with a music scene, if you want to see the local musicians, go there in January because they're on the road the rest of the time. And, and, and musicians aren't really touring in January. You have maybe a history of going to L.A. In, in, in January. I don't know, but you were going there anyways. And we had talked to Simon and, and I said, Simon, you've always you were always talking about doing a podcast. The, the original podcast for the audience, I don't know, was the idea was going to be Lydia Lunch and Dr. David Earl Budden. But now, that didn't, nobody knows, Doctor. <laughs> yeah. that it was going to be a, a masterful genius co- composer who is now called living on the south <laughs> banks of the Carolinas that nobody knows about is irrelevant. That right. was awarded. So basically, Simon said, you know, and Lydia is if, when there's an idea that's good, she, she's very open to it, and uh, it just let's see the goods. And so we have to put the money where the mouth is here sometimes. And so we we're all like, okay, our schedules are open. It's January. It all came together within a week, if I remember. I mean, I mean, January, January, LA versus January, uh, okay, New York so City. That, that, I guess that was my, my uh, query is that we went out there in January, February, but we didn't release until July. That's right. We didn't release till July because there was – a lot of anxiety around, well, we recorded all this stuff, but now what do we do? So we, there, was, there was a lot to figure out. How do we, we didn't even know how to release a podcast. And then there was a lot of discussion between Tim Weasel and I on how to exactly edit one. And I remember the first episode, Tim and I actually did several versions of it to figure out what I'm the, sure you have not only the two blabbermouths of myself and Tim Dahl, and then you add a guest who should who probably always desperately tries to get their own opinion in there. It can't be easy. I do recall we went out there and we recorded quite quite a few interviews. And Tim, is that when we played in Joshua was. Tree? So we, I felt like the, the very first one we did, we were all green with this. I mean, again, I used to talk so much as a kid, the teacher would isolate my desk and pull it next to hers to try to heal, humiliate me by isolating me from the rest of the kids. So talking was not the problem. It was whether I could even do the podcast format. And, and so we both, we all felt pretty good after that first one with Kid Nativity. Of course, that's always a, a kiss of death with me. When, once a, the arrogance car gets a little too high, I'm like, oh, I got this. And the next few ones were a little bumpy because I... <laughs> Back up there, doll. Hang on. <laughs> okay. well, maybe you were doing some bumpies, but I don't... <laughs> hey, hey, hey. So, so anyhow, but yes, going back to your original point, uh, we, we did end up in Joshua Tree. I did a solo performance. You did a spoken word performance. You drove a subpar spoken word young female off the stage because she couldn't handle the heat. I remember that. And, and then we had the one and only... Um, John Tottenham. Yes, exactly. Which blew Chris, my mind. I, I was like, whoa, where did this guy come from? John Tottenham, the premier poet of all time, friend, longtime friend of mine. Yes, I actually gonged somebody off the stage to get him out. And he was uh, one of my favorite podcasts. We podcasted him at the same time. We did Dave Catching and we did... Chris Hanley. Oh, one heard. second. Oh, Dave Catching, first of all, runs an incredible rock studio, De La Luna. Yeah. rock and roll studio in the middle of Joshua Tree, who's recorded many people, Queens of the Stone Age, etc. Chris Hanley not only recorded Africa Bombada when he lived in New York, 
but produce American Psycho. Oh, the list is too long. The side extent of Muse Productions. And he's also a modern architecture fetishist who, I mean. We get to your Airbnb where we had the dinner party that night. And I was like, this is really nice. I can't believe, I remember smarting in my head. I can't believe I'm going to be staying in a fucking Airstream. And then uh, Chris Hanley gave us these very vague directions into the desert to find this middle of the night, middle of the night this quote unquote trailer that was off any main road, which Tim and I get caught in the, like actually stuck in the desert. And when we finally find this place, it's not a trailer. It's a architecturally beautiful kind of modernist version of a trailer. I mean, it was really, really nice. Chris Hanley is a genius on so many levels. Yeah, uh, One of my favorite people. Uh, anyway, you got lost, but you got found. What was interesting about that is the directions were fairly clear, but when, you're, when directions go bad in a desert and the wind lets the sand consume the road, it's almost like being in a snowstorm. So we actually used a snowstorm technique to get us out of a fucking pile of sand, which was we wedged wood under the tire. Oh, okay, wait, I didn't know that not only not finding, you got trapped in a sand pit. We actually had to do a three-point turn, and the next thing you know, we're stuck in fucking sand. It sucked, but but we figured it out. Who else did we record in that initial period? So we had Tottenham, we had Chris Handley, we had Kit Nativa Dodd. Robert Williams. Robert Williams. Um, oh, amazing. Genius of lowbrow... Uh, mastery. Michael Imperioli, Jerry Stone. Oh, well, that was epic. I can tell that oh, from my perspective. Oh, boy. We recorded that, that after a show at the Standard Hotel. And now I realize that trying to record podcasts after a show is a terrible idea because everyone's been drinking. And I remember sitting backstage and Lydia looking at me like, get ready for this. The Standard Hotel had given us a conference room. So I had everything set up. I go in there. Michael Imperioli shows up. and. I'm a huge, huge Sopranos fan. So I was just trying to stop myself from saying things like Christopher. No so he comes in very, very pleasant. One thing about Michael Imperioli, he's incredibly humble, incredibly gracious, a really Absolutely. nice guy. And he's done those on the bill with me and Tim, me solo. Uh, he performed for, uh, with when we did No Way Out with Umar Ben Hassan. His book was released. I mean, he's done so many things, and of course, he's well known for The Sopranos and and Goodfellas. But as a Great human movie. being, stellar. Uh, yeah, good person. Stella. Good person. But that was one of the only podcasts we've had to do a second time because it was like two Huns okay. coming into the room and. The podcast, I mean, whenever we do a blooper reel, it will be a big part of it because it really makes no sense. But like you said, Michael Imperioli was such a nice and patient person that he did his best to answer your question. Anyway, I mean, look, this started and we knew we would go on with it. And I think after our first, even even just the L.A. recordings that we did first, and it's strange that we started recording in L.A., it was very easy to get people to commit to an hour of their time there. And, and so anyway, we come back and we just really continued, continued recording. And eventually we had so many, we had to we had put it on. We had mean, to another, another thing with the L.A. thing is in general, you go in L.A., you go to people's houses and in New York, you go somewhere to meet someone. It's just it's a different thing. So if you had a car in L.A. and like and they had the time. Hey, just come into my place. You know, so Lydia and I, you know, we're we're work, we're touring musicians. So any given year, you're you're just thrown in all these different environments. So when you, I, I had to look back, like what was the year, and it, it, you kind of can't even fucking believe it. Not not that I'm, I'm proud of that. It's just so insane, especially in contrast of just suddenly being locked into a spot. But so then along the way, I don't know what other interviews we had. Lydia had the tour with Mark Ritardo doing this suicide tribute. Which child abuse so child, jumped on in child, Brussels. Child abuse had a new record. We had a tour, so we were in Brussels. We did simultaneous show. We opened up for the suicide thing. Grid had a new album that year. Flying Ludenbaggers that Weasel's in. I toured with that. So basically, we were just in full force touring nonstop. We're all doing other shit. Somehow, we're managing to get interviews in between. I can I don't even know all the lists. Then we kind of go full circle. We find ourselves back in California. It's once again winter. And I guess you're right. When I asked you originally, why were we out there? It has been my habit when it gets a bit too cold. And I was still a nomad when we began doing the podcast. So, of course, I can go anywhere I want. 
But I usually do try to go to slightly warmer climes when it gets, you know, brutally sub-zero in New York. So here we were again this January. This is, February. February. This is the end of February, the second time around. Yeah, February 19th. Um, and yeah, what exactly. facilitated it was we, we got invited to go to Australia. Yes, including Tasmania and and. Cities in Australia I've never been to. Like, so there's uh, no been- way we're going to Australia without stopping in San Francisco and L.A. And that gave us an amazing opportunity to, you know, record the veil of research. Uh, Eugene Robinson of Oxford and, and a great writer and many other talents and things. Penelope Houston we did. In L.A. we did Cliff Martinez. We did Who's Coming Up Next? Who's Coming Up in a few minutes? Mark McLeod, the acid king of San Francisco. Zoe Amazing. Hansen. Kayla, uh, who, uh, House of Psychotic Women, she's coming up soon. Uh, Nanar Navai, who happened, because he lives the winters in the desert. Albert yeah. Olin. I mean, we did again. Oh, yeah, exactly. Albert Olin. Buck and Angel. Uh, yeah, Ms. Neon. Zachary Drucker. I mean, we did. We love doing these podcasts in person. With the COVID, with the lockdown, We've been forced to do them by Zoom, but that that's almost better because, in, and look, I'd rather be in person, but knowing that we have to do it by Zoom, our reach can go broader than what our pockets would allow us to travel. So let's go back to this v Vale San Francisco dinner. I have a million stories in San Francisco that were really funny, but the first thing that I want to say before we go to the dinner is how, in a way, how lucky we were that we were as naive as we were because COVID was really exploding. We really had no idea how bad it really was. In fact, I'm pretty sure I had it when I got on the airplane to go there because I I was sick. I remember leaving you guys, you guys stayed out late and I went to sleep. You know, had we known how bad it was, I highly doubt we would have recorded a lot of those episodes or at least in- in Okay, and just just capping that off. In spite of the fact that we went retrovirus, Tim Weasel, I and Barbara, to San Francisco, Australia, and Los Angeles. None of us got sick. I might have been sick in December. Tim got sick. Oh, I got, I got sick. I got sick on that fucking plane from California How to long Australia. How did it last? I don't think it was COVID. It, it was a 36-hour stomach thing. But I'll, I'll make it quick here. The Australian government, because it's already out, said basically if you have any signs of any sickness and you're not telling the uh, – immigration or, 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 or the passport control, like we're going to press charges. And basically I was puking on a fucking, the longest flight you can fucking have, right? It's like a 16 hour flight and I'm puking. I'm like, Oh my God. Uh, uh, I, I'm whatever you had, you didn't give it to the rest of us or anybody in the audience. So you had a stomach flu or you what, ate a bad taco. You ate a burrito before we got on the plane. That's true. <laughs> but Lydia, the point was, I had to negotiate with the stewardesses that are pressured to uh, write down who's sick on the fucking plane. And I was like, if you, you're going to keep your fucking mouth shut about this, like, let me go to the bathroom because I wasn't going to show up on a retrovirus tour in Australia where I'm hired and suddenly I'm fucking held back. So I'm like, I'm only thinking about myself, of course. I'm not even thinking like, oh, I'm right, Okay. All uh, right. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, abrupt. The horrible thing is Australia just decided they're not letting any international flights in or out. Till March 2021. Guess what? what? They're in their winter now, which is the projection for our next, our second wave. They're already anticipating, like, they're in the summer, people are outside before. The the summer is already locked down. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Look, this is not over. This is not going to end quickly. America, this, this, half of this country, or excuse me, three, I'm not taking a consensus. So fucking ignorant to do the simplest things to prevent the spread. And here we go. College students, idiot. Fra- 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 if you think that it's freedom to not wear a mask so that you can get, you're free enough to get sick and die, go right ahead. It's a fun. I think everybody should wear a mask. I think all men should wear fucking burkas. I think the whole head should be covered. I don't want to see any of you motherfuckers. We need to go back to suits of armor for a little. I guess. Did you see anyway. Cuomo? Did, did you see Cuomo today? Because. I think what he's setting up, this doesn't include drive-ins, but anything that's flying into Port Authority. Yes, is, good. He's basically, he's basically saying, like, we're going to press good. charges if you're coming from these fucking retard states without, you know, sorry. Look, for some, the of hot, <laughs> some of us think hot dad, that's Cuomo, who we might not have agreed with before, has handled this better than anybody else in this country. And he got New York City down 
to a baseline of infection. All right. Look, America is banned from everywhere else because we're sick and polluted. Fine. So if New York State has it semi under control, we need to ban the carriers. You know what? If the whole country would have just been intelligent enough to lock down for two months straight, it would have been over. They can't do it. Because they they have false rebellion and they think that freedom is, I guess, free enough to fucking die. Go ahead. I'm all for it. I think death is a great thing, especially for most of the people that are supporting Trump, what can I say? All right. I want to get back to the v Bale dinner before this is forgotten because that was hilarious. (laughs) At the end of all the, the recordings, which we did... I think most of them at V Vale's house, which was very generous of him. Uh, Tim and I, I think we're both tired and ready to eat. And Tim was like, well, should we go get something to eat after this? Tim usually has a good idea of where to eat. V Vale hears about this. He goes, well, where are you guys going to eat? And we're like, well, we don't have any idea. You know, we're going to go down the street. And he goes, oh, no, 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 no. I know how to eat for, I think it was like an <laughs> well, no, 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 low amount, like no, three dollars no, 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 a piece. Side note, he said it like this, because we're like, where should we eat? And he goes, well, one thing's for certain, you shouldn't spend more than $10. Tim not only knows, okay, okay. On. <laughs> Tim not only knows where to eat, he is the dining navigator on retrovirus tours, finding obscure locations that have incredible food, with his uh, psychotic ability to hone in to exactly wherever it is, he's got an incredible talent for it. So now you're trusting Bevel. He may know where to things. Exactly. All right. Tim's right. He said that we shouldn't eat for more than $10. I was a little confused. Like, is that each or all together? And he felt that it was all combined. What? Yeah. So then he's like, I know this place. We can eat for, you know, extremely cheap. Funny box, yeah. So then he takes us to a, was it a Thai restaurant or was it a Chinese restaurant? It was a Chinese restaurant. It was a Chinese restaurant. I just heard a dog barking. It must not have been a Chinese restaurant. Oh, no, no, no. It wasn't. It was um, Vietnamese, right? Was it Vietnamese? Yeah, but it was a Vietnamese restaurant. That's right. It was a Vietnamese restaurant. And we go there and and there was nothing wrong with the restaurant. But we did spend, I think, about $3 per person. And there was you and me. And he wouldn't let us order. He, he wouldn't, wouldn't let, let us order. order. He said, he goes, there, there's a few dishes. We're all going to share it. We're going to split it because no one could spend more than $10. That's, that was the rule. Well, certainly he didn't want to get stuck with paying. He spent much less than $10 a person. I remember, I think I, I, I think my, I had to go to the ATM and I think I ended up spending like four or $5 on that meal. And I was starving. And, and you were still wanting more. <laughs> Well, what we said was, I sat there, we both, Tim and I were like, thank you very much. That was really, really good. And, you know, thanks for recording all the podcasts. And then when they left, Tim looked at me and goes, should we go get something to eat? Well, th- this is actually re- very revealing, Lydia, because Simon and I knew each other since high school. We have a tradition when people that we respect and we want to respect them provide a uh, scenario. And we, we collectively do are yeah. not, we're not satisfied so we, we don't want to rain on their parade and we kind of let them go and then we definitely redo it. Well, okay, I'm going to ask this question. <laughs> I hope neither of you hungry men have ever left my house hungry. Yeah. Not a chance. Not just, in fact, Simon, for being as skinny and as healthy on his, his own way as he is, you go to a restaurant with Simon, he's ordering a lot of stuff. That, that, the whole table is full. He wants samplers. He's willing to spend more money to have samples of a lot of things. I mean, next time I need my refrigerator cleaned out, you're welcome. But I always feed you when you come over. Yes, you do. Anyway, look. All right, wrapping this up. We started the Lydian Spin and have succeeded in creating what I consider one of the finest audio museums out there. Interviews with incredible creative individuals from all walks of creativity spanning the globe and actually going to span further on the globe now that we are now that we have no choice but to do it by zoom i want to continue to do this because after being interviewed so many times in my life and collaborating with so many people i still think that conversation and information and investigation and journalism and documentation is a very important part of what i do and I also like to expose people I think 
are connected some bizarre way to this counterculture. So I'm very happy that Simon Slater pushed, because we did have this idea, but he pushed for it to happen. This is our one year anniversary. It's going to continue because we're not going to shut up. <laughs> hey, honey, I haven't shut up for 43 fucking years. I'm not dying tomorrow. How did you know David Yao? I mean, how did we get him on the podcast? Because you, well, you, I knew David Yao because Jesus Lizard is one of my favorite bands. Because they, they're under the same period as the Butthole Surfers. I mean, that were, there was that period in, in the 80s where, yeah, where it was really alternative, aggressive, ugly, sexy, perverse rock of which Jesus Lizard, Butthole Surfers, The Cows. Uh, there were a few of those bands, mostly out of the Midwest or Texas, that just had this incredible period. And also that David Yao does, you know, he, he's, he also acts, he also does graphics. I mean, most of the people that we are highlighting here, I mean, they're specialists, but they also wear many, many hats. And David Yao, um, trust me, he needs to wear a Jimmy hat because he likes to get that thing out. Just saying, David Yao. <laughs> This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch. Tim Dahl and David Yao, most notorious for Scratch Acid, Jesus Lizard, and other acts of grand atrocity. Thank you for being here, honey buddy. Thanks for having me. You know I didn't I mean? know you were a whistler. <laughs> I like to have a little afternoon whistle, you know. Mm, you call it that, but I'm sure there's more to it than that. It blows! <laughs> oh my god. That's <laughs> why I told you. To, oh, oh, I think he's going to the bathroom. I think he's well, wet his that pants. That was it. That was the fastest interview yet. Oh. <laughs> Suddenly. <laughs> this is a Lydian spin. <laughs> Those glasses above. Oh, oh, oh. That's Suddenly. The, this is the Lydian spin. Well, the, the whistle was actually the call hey. to the. Uh, Whiskey. Was it? No, it was a uh, tur- wild turkey. What is it? <laughs> that was a wild. <laughs> that wasn't a gobble. It was that a was a it. wild turkey call to the Buffalo Trace. My friend, ask and you shall receive. If not, just take. That's always been my theory. Now, here we are. Ice cube. Yeah, it's, no, thanks. That's my very, it's, very favorite bourbon. What? Buffalo Trace. I brought it for you. Well, Did, I stole it from a club no, last no, night. She, she gave it to you in San Diego and said, remember, I forgot her name already. Okay. Adele. Yeah, she said, just tell her that Adele gave it to Bartender her. Bartender in San Diego at our show the other night, maybe she smelled that you were coming. Huh, that makes sense. <laughs> my mother and my sister both had the middle name Adele. Here we go again. Yeah, now, well, you're drinking from the fount of the San Diego in Adele. So enjoy, my friend. I have a chocolate chip bourbon bread pudding recipe that you have to use buffalo trace for. Because smell it's, it's like bananas. Doesn't it smell like bananas? It's, it's chocolate chip. It, are there bananas in your bread as well? David, mm-hmm. yeah, you have so many talents. I didn't know that baking was one of them. That's the only thing I bake. What? I That's wrote a cookbook. Tell me about wait a minute, it. Wait, 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 say it again. It's a chocolate chip bourbon bread pudding. With Buffalo Trace. But Yeah, you can use any bourbon you want, but, but Buffalo you don't. Trace That's is the, the one. one to do it. Now, why do you only have one thing you bake? Baking, I, I, I prefer grilling or doing stuff Tim on top Tim Doyle is a master griller. Here we go. You know, I wrote a cookbook called The Need to Feed. Did you really? And I think you should investigate it. We'll talk about that later. Uh, I didn't what do you know. like to grill? Last night I grilled... Um, Last night? You, uh, he is a master uh, grill. Chicken and uh, zucchini. A whole chicken or a cut? No, no. Cut into pieces and stuck on skewers. And I Marinated. ordered new skewers today because my skewers suck. You know what? I collect what stainless steel chopsticks, but they're not for cooking. They're for actually tying people's nipples. Did I say that? <laughs> you told me I had lovely nipples. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Everybody knows that, David. Tell me something I don't know, mainly about yourself. Besides painting, grilling, baking bread with Buffalo Trace, what the hell are you doing, my friend, these days? Well, I do photo retouching for a living, and I work too many hours a week, generally. Yesterday, though, I told him I had to leave early at 1 o'clock so that I could go over to the Skirball Museum to see a Stanley Kubrick photography exhibit. Was oh, it I fabulous? It, yeah. it's, it's, coming, it's coming down on Sunday, tomorrow. Okay, because it's already been in New York. Um, I, I think maybe so. I think so. I, I, I've yeah. been seeing advertising. I, I think, I it's think called it Through a Different but... Lens. Yeah. What, yeah. Was your favorite, what was your favorite image in that? <laughs> <laughs> there are a few, but there's Welcome one. Welcome to David Yao. There's one of a fella with round sunglasses looking at some sort of light fixture. It looks like Dr. Strangelove or... The photography is amazing, and it shows 
it really forecasts what an amazing guy he is for composition and, you know. So as a photo retoucher, I mean, do you do photography as well or you just work on other people's photos? I mostly work on other people's photos. It's How did you even art. get into that? When Photoshop first came out, um, I read an article that you could edit somebody out of a picture. I was going, no fucking <laughs> way. And so I started fucking around with it and stuff. And then I was doing some stuff, or I was at this guy's place, a, a company in Chicago called Run and Gun. And um, uh, he had a scanner. And I said, oh, you've got a scanner. Can I get a scan of something? He said, yeah, sure. What do you want? And I said, I don't care. A photograph. And he gave me this picture of him when he used to be a park ranger. And it's two rows of 12, six guys. There's 12 guys standing there with their arms crossed. Arms crossed in uniforms. And I wanted to get rid of all the other guys and just leave him standing there. So that was your first experiment. Yeah, and I, and I didn't know anything about resolution. It fit on a floppy disk. And I left so the floppy. So we're talking, when was this? <laughs> Early 90s? 92. Okay. 91, 92. He, a couple of weeks later, he called and he said, hey, I saw that thing you did. You want a job? <laughs> yes. And so then I just, that's how it started. So you yeah. were, have you been doing it since then? Not yeah. for a living. I started doing it for a living in 99 after the Jewel Lord broke up. Let's go back to the beginning now. Was that Austin, Texas? Well, you were born in Vegas, though, right? I was born in Vegas, but we, I lived there for less than you, two years. You kind of have a little bit of the stink of Vegas on you somewhere. <laughs> That's a buffalo trace. <laughs> <laughs> Call it what you will, honey. So you went to Austin. As a young man, were you in Austin? Is that where all this started? Well, my father was an Air Force pilot, and so I was born in Vegas, so we moved to North Africa. Do you then remember we, any of that? I don't remember Vegas. I remember North Africa. Morocco? Um, Libya. How long, how long were you in Libya for? For four years. So from, from the age of what? Two to six. And you know what? Memories at that point can be can impregnate us forever. We what got do you our remember? First, we got our first pussy cat, meow. My father hated cats. And he Why? Was, he was a text boy. He's a dog. Well, he's yeah, a dog, dog lover. lover. I love cats. And my sister and I brought home this kitten and begged to have it. And he said, well, all right, we can have the cat, but we got to name it meow. And a cat in the world can say her own name. So, uh, okay, so you, you got a cat with your dad. You're living in Libya. And did the cat survive your exit of Libya? Yes. Actually, we moved from Libya to Durham, North Carolina, and she didn't show up on the plane. And I guess somebody had let her out of her box. And like three days later, she showed up at our house 30 miles away. She walked there. Yeah. Because no. cats yeah. can be that smart. Yeah. It's like Milo and Otis. Any memories besides the pussycat of Libya? I remember our, the, we lived on base, then we lived off base. And when we lived off base, the Mediterranean was our backyard. Beautiful. Yeah. Wonderful. It was great. I remember being on a little raft and having my dad tote my sister and me around and seeing octopus and oh, skates. Incredible. And stuff I like love that. octopus. And, and so uh, how turbulent, what, what was the, because I don't know what, what year, year that was. Yeah, that? How yeah. turbulent was Libya at the time? Was it, uh, it wasn't. We it were wasn't allies then. Before the yeah. whole yeah. 80s Gaddafi. Yeah. Gaddafi, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that was 19... 12 to 1916. 1912 to 1916. <laughs> I'm totally fucking with you, I know, I know. I'm just you like, guys, be cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was 62 to 66. I'm looking at now something that must have been inspired by that Libyan age. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Copycat and a litter of other cats by David. Yeah, what the hell is this, David? It's a pun book. An irresistible and hilarious book of cat cartoon portraits for all cat lovers, old, young, and in between. If I had a copy of it, I would have brought you one, but I don't have one. Well, copy that's of it. okay. I'm looking at the cover, and it's kind of cute and creepy, just like you. Cute and creepy. I have to just butt it in and get this off my chest. You are one of, and this is the highest compliment I can give. I have to say, David Yao. Jesus Lizard. This is one of the creepiest musical experiences I have ever had. I like to describe it as, and really, because I'm a fucking creep, the gum under the table you don't want to touch. Now, somebody who's as creepy as I might think of that as a compliment, and I hope you take it as such. I'd like to think it were the gum under the table that you would like to touch. Maybe your gum under the table that I'd shoot spat out, and I hope you touch again with your tongue. Yeah. All right, then. Like <laughs> Elf. <laughs> Let's go back to uh, Texas. When did you know you had to start doing music? I think when I first saw the punk rock in, at Raul's. On Halloween of 79, I saw the Huns in, at Raul's in Austin, and it completely changed I don't my know life. who the Huns were. What were the Huns? They were just a terrific uh, 
band, punk band from Austin at the time. So and like, I got to do that. It's sort of, kind of, yeah. What year was that? 79. 79. So Scratch Acid, when did, was that the first outing musically for you? No, I played bass in a throwaway punk band before that. Did that matter, though? It was fun. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. You got your dick wet. Yeah. Tell me about Scratch Acid. How'd that come to be? So you played bass in a throwaway punk band inspired by the Huns that nobody's ever heard of, I don't think. But if they did, whatever. And here we go. Now what? How does Scratch Acid, what? How? I, man, I don't remember how we started. But you started. Yeah. How long did that go for? You remember? I don't. From, I think we started in 82 and broke up in 87. Did you do a lot of touring at that point? We did a lot of U.S. touring. We went to Europe once and the West Coast only once. Who was putting your stuff out then? Rabid Cat Records did our... Again, the cat connection. <laughs> yeah. They did our first EP and our first album, and then the last record we did was on Touch and Go. Was that successful? I mean, according to our standards as, you know, uh, under the radar rock... I always figured at that point, that if, you, if you sell over a thousand records, of course. it's a success. And Definitely. I mean, if people you don't even know are buying it, then you know, you're doing pretty good. And so then you're slowly or you're now establishing a relationship with Touch and Go, which is going to lead you to probably your next big step in your next big band. What yeah. ended Scratch Acid? Ray Washam, our drummer, who's one of the best drummers alive in the world... Or if he was dead, he'd still be the, the best drummer anyway, in the other world. He's just an amazing drummer, and he's quite the um, perfectionist. And uh, our guitar player, Brett, who is exceptionally wonderful, is not a per perfectionist. And so they, they often would clash. Are you a perfectionist? Uh, I'm not. No, well, I not work with, with, not them, with that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, not with right. the singing. I mean, you know. I, you know. Come on. And so, yeah, so that we was just, the it was, yeah, interpersonal band, you know what they say. Diplomatic. Yeah. Uh, uh, no <laughs> bullshit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basic, basic <laughs> bullshit. So yeah, they break up, and then what? You're not done. You're just beginning. Like, hey, hey, come on. Well, actually, I kind of was done. I didn't want to, I didn't have much desire to do it again. And then this fellow named Dwayne Dennison, who's a really good guitar player who's living there in Austin, um, had some free studio time or something, and he wrote a few tunes, and he asked me if I would play bass on him. And I said, well, sure, but I'm not a very good bass player. We should get David Sims to do it. And he said, oh, you think he'd do it? And I said, sure he would. So we got together like eight or nine songs with a drum machine and just recorded them as a project, and that was that. And then David and I moved to Chicago. Why'd you go there? Austin had become such a little patent place, and it was just, you know... Everybody had fucked everybody else. It's always it was, good to move, but why, why? Why Chicago? Why'd you go to Chicago and not New well, York? Touch Thank and go, you. and knowing people well, there was that. Yeah, was that it? and David had joined this band with Steve Albini and Ray. Which one? Ray I don't like to that even say the name. Matter. of it. I don't care. Um, like even mentioned Steve Albini's name, but that's another story. Yeah, and so I was going to be a drum tech for them because they were going to be touring all over the world. And then I moved up there, and Steve said, "No, we don't need a drum tech." So I got a job at a restaurant, and then they broke up. And then Dwayne wanted to release those songs that we'd done as a project. And so Corey at Touch and Go wasn't so much into it. He didn't like the record that much, but he thought that if we got a real drummer that we had potential. And so we got this real drummer, Mac McNeely from Atlanta, Georgia, who's not only an incredible drummer, but the nicest guy in the world. He's a girl who just can't say no. I'm he a girl that often there. just can't say I'm yes because my favorite word is no. <laughs> Wave. Thank you. Is it really? I love to say no. Uh, I say yes. So you're going to say things. yes. <laughs> is, is, is no your favorite word? <laughs> one of them. Uh, it's a trap. Well, it's one of them. Yes, it is. Because you know what? The sooner you say no to something you don't want to do, the better you feel. And sometimes you don't have to say yes, you just do it. No. Yes. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Carry on. Corey didn't really like this crap until you get in a real drummer, but you were like, yeah, all right, you get a drummer in. Now what? Released the record. Uh, yeah, and then Mac came up to uh, Chicago, and it was funny. He said that his friends all told him, like, now when you get up there and they're all a bunch of junkies, you just turn right back around and come on home. Were you a <laughs> and, you? and we weren't junkies, you so weren't we stayed. You were a junkie? And, um, and there's no junkies in Texas, is what you're saying. Yeah, we're, we're <laughs> Atlanta. He's from Atlanta. Atlanta. Georgia. Georgia. Yeah. Well, Georgia, are you yeah, kidding yeah, there's, me? There's no junkies How there. come <laughs> you weren't a junkie? Too bored by those kind of drugs? I don't know. Yeah, I think needles yeah, are the only thing I never did. Well, you know, I love needles, but not when there's heroin in them. Yeah. I nice. prefer extracting blood than oh, inserting brown crap in my beautiful red blood. Just saying, anyway. 
So, first album is coming out, Now Again on Touch and Go by Jesus Lizard. Yeah, Pure, which was the first record, which I think is a six or eight song EP, and it's with a drum machine. What year was that? I think 89. Well, did they help you go on tour, Touch and Go, at that point? We never got tour support. We didn't get money. Never heard of it in my career. They, um, you know, I think that they would help set up interviews and stuff. I, actually, at that time... I don't think they even set up it. They didn't really have a publicist. You know what? Record companies just put out your record, maybe gave you a couple of bucks or some copies to sell, and that's what they did. But that's the shit we couldn't do because we couldn't afford to manufacture our own shit then. Well, they did on one of those very early tours. They gave us a few boxes of that first that record. That helps. But because uh, they were defective, they were Cunts. one side was like the wrong record or something like that. So we took them on tour and used them as props. Ah. And um, boy, oh boy, I sure realized later that it, we're lucky that nobody got, since like really frisbees. badly you used hurt. Them as frisbees. We, were, we were throwing these things like frisbees. You frisbees. You know, you hit that. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, and you don't see them if the, if the oh, angle's yeah. right at all until they hit you in you the face. You can cut somebody's we played, throat. We played a place in Richmond, Virginia, and I don't remember the name of it, but it had a really high ceiling. It was like a 40-foot high ceiling. And we finished the show, and a friend of mine said, Hey, David, look. And he pointed up, and there was a record stuck in the uh, ceiling oh, yes. about 40 feet up. <laughs> you know, music should be dangerous. Yeah. In Illinois, I remember seeing a photograph of a piece of paper stuck in a tree because of a tornado. Oh, that's exactly. so cool. Yeah. Think about a paper that is cut. so cool. <laughs> that's so painful. Yeah, I mean, that's so insane. I mean, so, so you have the Texas touch and go connection. So I have to ask you, Butthole Surfers, I mean, were they ever asking you to uh, go on tour with them? Or, I mean, they were already kind of getting this big cult following. We didn't do any actual touring with them. We did play a few shows. Okay. Uh, with them, we played a bunch of with, with them in Texas. Yeah, I, I, I have to say, I love that period of Butthole Surfers and Jesus Lizard. I mean, it was really weird, outrageous, perverse, ugly, yet attractive outsider rock. Well, yeah, in the early '80s and '85, there was not a better band on earth than the Butthole Surfers. I'm, they were untouchable. Cherub is one of my favorite songs, and it was used in a you know, Rich Kern film. And I just think that. My naked body and that song together, you can't beat it with a stick. Although you could try, but I'm just probably say, try harder, fucker. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, so sorry. We're back in Chicago. Uh, it's 89, and now you have a band that has a good indie label that doesn't have necessarily a publicist, but they're, they're encouraging. They're not discouraging, it sounds like. And, the, you know, your post-drum machine, you have a real drummer, is that when you just kind of get down in the mud and just kind of hit the road hard? Yeah, yeah. We we just started touring nonstop, nonstop, right? Nonstop. And then and then of course it's becoming a, it, it's it's evolving. It's getting more refined slash unrefined. It's getting better, and you're and you're finding your own voice. I think so. I mean, it's funny when the first time I met your ex Jim Thurwell was at CBGB's, and uh, after the show he said, um, "I really like what you're trying to do." And I went, trying to do? <laughs> and I thought, well, what the, f does that mean he likes the birthday party or what the fuck? And so, who like didn't early actually on, like the birthday party? They're pretty the, good, but. You know, I think, it's, I think it's normal for anyone who's doing some sort of artistic endeavor to really wear whatever they're influenced by on their sleeve. And then hopefully, ideally, you know, you kind so of metamorphose and grow away from that. So, were you wearing the birthday party on your sleeve? I think so, sure. Scratch Look, I have to say, they. At the time, were one of my favorite bands I ever saw. Word. Until Roland S. Howard left and Nick Hay became a fucking heinous balladeer of the Wayne Newton dimension, but Birthday Party were fucking amazing. Uh, they were pretty good. And if you're going to take that as your influence, which means kind of angular rhythms, ugly, yeah, beautiful lyrics. And when you, like you said, dangerous. And dangerous. It was really fucking dangerous. Both of you, uh, you know, danger is obviously a part of your performance a lot of times. And, 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 oh. that, and that, and that, uh, the whole crowd interaction. I mean, wait, I know wait, working wait, with her wait, for wait, years. So dangerous about me. Well, so, all right, we don't have enough time. Well, for that. We're mean, talking about David. Well, yep. sometimes people come, come to you uh, and ask for danger. So I mean, masturbate. It, it, it arrives in many forms and in many ways. And I uh, wish. Bring it on, motherfucker. Bring it on. He, in my opinion, because he's such a fucking delightful, weird creep. His very nature is dangerous to most people's psyche. Because I don't even know what's under there, but he's a really nice guy, David Yao. But there is a fucking creep lurking of the highest dimension, and I love it. 
girls particularly used to it seemed like they used to be afraid of me and yeah, I'm, girls I'm, are, I'm, I'm boys really are nice and I'm not going to hurt well, anybody you know but maybe you should be not- how, how would they express this or how did you sense this I would run away uh, th- th- I would I would be told by others she's really afraid of you what about men were they afraid of you did the men come to you uh, I don't know. You'd have to ask them. And, and what was the ratio of men to female in the audience, uh, especially as you guys started becoming more and more popular? With, with Scratch Acid, it was 89.3 <laughs> male, <laughs> and the rest was girls. The Jesus Lizard, I think we started getting more and more, there would be more, more girls. You know the, what, what I concert. don't like is when the girls come, I love, what, I call it the gloss pit. I just said, they said the Bosch pit. I got the gloss pit. But the girls always want to be with the girl. They want to be with me. I'm like, hey, there's three other guys in the band. You know, you don't have to go with this faggot. Yeah, see? I mean, I'll gladly give you my, um... <laughs> That's exactly what <laughs> I'll gladly give you my coronavirus. Yeah, gladly give you my leftovers. All know. right, so, so, so you're, you're, you're touring like crazy. Jesus Lizard, it's it's growing. It's becoming a successful band. So then what? Are you are you happier at that point? How or long did you, that you, even I, go on for? I mean, I'm smacked up 10 years. It was 10, well, our first show was in July of 1989 in Chicago, and then the last one was somewhere in 1999. I saw the revival at All Tomorrow's Parties, and I loved it. Oh, yeah, yeah, Mindhead. We're one, one of the revivals. And Kathy Unsworth. And well, what I, what, so I walked up to you with Kathy Unsworth, who's an amazing you know, uh, true crime writer now who was a musical jur- journalist for many years and wrote a lot of your liner notes, good friend of mine. We said, David, you're looking good. And he said, I look like Willie Nelson Strodum. I go, well, I guess that means you look pretty good. You're kind. Well, you said it, not me. I'm just repeating it. Well, clearly Willie Nelson has a very handsome scrotum. <laughs> Even at his ripe age of, was he 80? He's really old now, like 84? <laughs> yeah, uh, so 10 years ago, right? I, was, I don't remember when that was, but was I think it was I think it was interesting because Jesus and Lizard were on the bill, and I was doing... One of their first spoken word curatorial things Who was? there. I was. I curated okay. one of the first spoken word things at all tomorrow's parties. Because I'm always trying to push that shit on people. You know me. like to talk. All right. So the success, you have 10 years. You're enjoying it. And then you're not enjoying it. What made it break up the first round? Well, we did a bunch of records on Touch and Go. How many? Name them off. Pure head, goat, liar, lash, show. One uh, word. Down. Titles. Show wasn't on Touch and Go. What's down. your favorite? Either goat or liar. So you stopped for a while, and then well, well, we I, did. We did uh, two records. We signed to Capitol Records. Okay. And How the hell? Well, is Capitol Records signed Jesus Lizard. What they see in you, son? That's what I told him. I told Gary Gersh was running at the time, and I said we're not going to sell any more records. And he said, I don't think. So. I think you're wrong, David. I think you're going to sell a lot of records. And of course, we didn't. And um, we you signed. Were, a, you were right. A three record contract. After Good two. Money. That's the whole reason I bought a house. That's Why else would you reason. fucking sign? There's no other reason. They give to you a good advance, yes. Yeah. And good for you. Because that was kind of in the buying, you know, the period the last, of the last buying. wave of the year. Uh, buying the, up all It was bands. the Nirvana, po- yes, post yes. Nirvana feeding frenzy. Around, yeah. Yes. They you didn't. They didn't know. Anything. They didn't know what to do you with us. You weren't going to change anything. Yeah. Then after two records, they said, uh, "Okay, you can you can go." And I said, <laughs> "Great, I quit." And so that was. And you quit the band and Capital. Yeah, done? yeah. Had you relocated to Los Angeles at that point? No, or you were still no, in Chicago. Still Chicago. And then when, when did you move here? 2002 or 2001. So shortly after. But did you feel, yeah. okay, you had Scratch Acid, pretty cool band. You had G's Lizard, really cool band. Do you feel like, okay, I did it, and I did all these albums, and that's what I had to do, and that's done. That's enough for now. It's sort of, kind of. I was in a band for a while called Qui, and we did some cool stuff. And they, they What was the difference exist. between that? And Jesus Lizard Quee. How do you spell that? Q U I. What does it mean? Well, they say it's a Minnesotan for a homosexual, which it's not. <laughs> okay. the, the others say. What do you say? It's, they? It's, it's short for colloquialism. Okay. Whatever. Call it what you will. What yeah. was the difference in the sound? They were much more disjointed and like angular. Um, angular. Um, it was just a guitar and drums, no bass. How and long did that go on for? Just sporadic? They shit? still exist. The okay, two with, guys, without you. Yeah, it was two guys from Minneapolis. 
Matt Cronk and Paul Christensen. Uh, they had Quee going for a few years, and then I was going to do a guest appearance a few times with them, and then I just sort of became part of the band. Time to, time to rock again. Yeah. And uh, we did that, and it was a blast, and then we stopped doing that, and then some crap happened, and then... It was all all done. And then a few years ago, um, the Flipper Boys asked me to sing for them. To sing in Flipper? Yeah. Yes. Which, there's no, I mean, I kind of was done with music. Yeah. Well, I think, I, well, I, I, think we I think there will be little projects throughout the rest of my life. Just little Why things. Not? Sure. But I don't want to be, I don't have the time the or energy, inclination to do, I didn't mean to spit on you. You um, can lick it off later. Uh, to do full time, you know, it's a lot of hard work for what? You know what I mean? I mean, you really, it's got to burn in your blood if you want to go on tour in this day and age. Yeah. Or, I mean, you can't create music. You don't have to leave your house. Yeah, that's true. And I wish more people would not leave their house and just stay there and not let anybody well, hear it. But this coronavirus might be the uh, solution. I can't to that wait. At that point. So, you, were you doing photo retouching the whole time? Were you also getting into artwork at the time? You know, while well, all you projects progress degress and stop i mean well i learned photoshop while the jesus lizard was going but i didn't do it professionally until after we broke up which was funny because when the band broke up i'd bought a house and my wife and i had a comfortable living and stuff and why not and, and the band broke up and me? i thought what the fuck am i gonna do and i looked i'd done some construction i looked into doing construction and i didn't want to do that and then I, heard, I saw that you could make a, a shit ton of money doing photo retouching i said well i know how to do that and that's what I did. And then when did you become more arty at it, like releasing your books on weirdo cats? Well, I was in art school. I, was, I went to school for art, so that means that I'm really good at it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Which exactly. art school did you go to? Oh, uh, yeah. Southwest Texas State University. Like everybody else that went to art school to learn how much in depth they're going to be for the rest of their draw, lives. Draw a Bambi. So you, so then you moved to Los Angeles. What was the decision behind that, or what was the reasoning behind that? Um, largely because the work that I was doing in Chicago was all for advertising companies. And I understand in a capitalist society, advertising is like, it's a necessary evil. It's not that big of a deal. I respect Marketing, good though, advertising, though. Huh? I like advertising. I, love to do, I would love to do some commercials, voiceovers, write commercials. I think that there was a period when there were actually some really cool commercials. Uh, advertising can be really appropriate. It's propaganda. I yeah, I don't think advertising, I don't have that m much of a problem with advertising. Yeah. I have a problem with marketing. Marketing gets dis more and more despicable all the well, time. But, and in all kinds of avenues, like political marketing, people like Karl Rove and stuff like that. I was doing these Frito-Lay store ads with Would you Carl get free Matt, Fritos? Like just, just, <laughs> it was just hideous, horrible shit. And so I thought, okay, well, I can move to California and have it do key art, which is just stuff for movies. I just do movie posters and billboards well, and stuff. Well, that's going to be a lot more satisfying because there's your art background finally paying off that student debt with those movie posters. Yeah. And, your, and your wife, did she have a career that she had to, you had to convince her to leave Chicago too? Or she's like, no, just do this. Well, she was born born in Anaheim and she always wanted to go back okay. and at the, by that time we'd moved to northwest Indiana oh boy why? oh boy wait about oh. Gary is that right where did you live uh, uh, south of Gary um, why uh, Crown Point that's where your house was that you spent your advance on in yeah. northwest Jeez. Indiana yeah because I was married at the time and we w wanted to have maybe have kids and her folks lived like a mile away so and, it, and also I was on tour all the time. So we figured we could have a kid and live in Northwest Indiana, and did the mom would be there. Did you have a kid? No. I'm glad to hear it. No. And you got out of Northwest Indiana. We did, and then we moved out here, and the marriage crumbled, and she went to school. I'm also glad to hear that. Yeah, <laughs> but she's back in Chicago now, and she's doing well. That's and I love her. I'd do anything for her, but I can't spend more than thirty minutes with her. Well, that's what happens when you know romance dies. Turns to disgust often. And you, and you stayed here. I stayed here. Happily. And um, yeah. Yeah, I had kind of a, a midlife crisis, which was a blast. Who does Okay, it? well, what, what, can I ask you what you did in your, how did you express your midlife crisis? I fucked everything I could find. Okay. Uh, did you have to pay for a lot of that, or did you get <laughs> Just asking. If you could afford it, why not? Hiring a hottie. Well, if you can get it for free, why I guess pay? you could, but you know, sometimes you want to raise the bar. Yeah, some people have fetishes too. Hey, yeah, I mean, I love a creep. That doesn't mean I'm going to fuck you. <laughs> right. I mean, we can negotiate that later, but so, I'm so, just saying. So, when did you know your midlife crisis was over? When I started getting serious with my girlfriend. Better than getting serious STDs. Did yeah. you find her by fucking aloof? 
Was she just another fuck on the chain, and we're what? She, she is the sister of a good friend of mine, my buddy Todd. Always Phillips. great to fuck your friends' sisters or yeah, mothers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That 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 made for some comedy. Did you ever fuck any of your friends' mothers? Hmm. David Yao and the Lydian Spin. Contemplating his sexual deviance over the years. I don't. Th- I don't think so. Oh well, you better think a little harder. I'm sure you haven't. Why not? Well, maybe you like him young. How much younger is your wife than you? Your girlfriend, your thing, whatever. She's you like. five years younger than me. Oh, that's man. not nearly enough. So you went through rounds of sticking your dick in anything that would allow you to, and then you found the one that actually made you sing again in a manner of speaking. Yeah, she's swell. Nice. After the 10 years of Jesus Litter and breaking up, you guys have, I don't know, was it, was it money or what it was, but every now and then you guys kind of come back and do a couple shows. The first one, the impetus is always one big thing. Like the first one was ATP, yeah, Alto Arms Party. Parties. And they offered us so much money. They was like, well, you'd, you'd be stupid just not to. Jesus, and then, right. Jesus yeah. also did one there under the Melvins and Mike Patton. <clears throat> they offered so much ridiculous money. Yeah. They ain't doing that again. And so I think we've done three reenactment tours, and each one has come about because somebody somewhere says, well, here's so much money you can't say no. Right. <clears throat> and then we just tack some more other shows on with it. The last being right at the end of 2019, we played Nashville and Philadelphia, and then we played New Year's Eve in Brooklyn yeah. a couple months ago. And that was a lot of fun. And Nashville is, you know, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting about bands, and if we've all been in them. Sometimes you don't know why, but certain cities, and you would never suspect why, just like you, and you go back to those cities, and they're just there. And different bands I've been in, they're different cities, but why? And I'm curious, Nashville being one of them for you guys? No, it was Nashville because um, that's right now, by the way. Wow, right, got, got well, east, eastern part of it. Got fucked up. Our guitar player lives there, and so it's the most central location for me in California, Max in Chicago, Dwayne's in New Nashville, and David's in New York. Backline companies, all that stuff. There's some like, yeah. people that you like, and you just keep going back to. And for me, that would be Weasel Walter, and he's going to come in with a few questions right now. <laughs> I, I had one main question. I think historically, you were legendary for doing tricks with your genitals, and I was wondering if you could touch on that for a moment. No, nope. touch and go. Uh, well, um. Most of those were taught to me by Jim Rose from the Jim Rose Circus Sideshow. A legend. Yeah. And uh, so I can't take credit for most of them. The Ugly Rose of Bloomin', I think every, bo- every boy has done that. That's when you take your dinger and you mish it back down into its own skin and then pull the skin of your scrotum up over it so it looks just like a little mound. And if you're n- not really clean, so it's a little bit sticky, it's best. And then you let go and it's sort of slowly Flowers. blooms oh. and and gibby gave gave it the name the ugly rosa bloomin it's, it's uh, like an, it's like an alien and aliens when that little thing comes out it's all kind of like yes sticky it, just, and, and it presents strings. itself yeah yeah, yeah yeah going back to girls being uh worried about you or or I being afraid of you. i didn't want to fuck you for a couple of years because i thought you were a fucking rose blooming dick diddling creep David, I only say it out of great respect because I am the creepiest person I know, and when I see another creep, I just feel some kind of kinship. That's nice. Thank you. Who were some of the who were some of the bands that you really liked in that period, and that you might even still like now? Because we don't have many we like. Yeah, the the buttholes, the dicks, Terminal Minds, Sharon Tate's Baby, all local Austin bands. God, there were so many. But that was the period when there were a lot of good bands. It's kind of difficult now. Yeah, and it was cool also at the time. Like, I mean, I saw uh, Teenage Jesus at, at uh, what was it? What? Um, at uh, Duke's Royal Coach. I got no idea about that. You remember that in no, Austin? I don't. Huh. I don't even relate, but remember going south. <laughs> that Maybe it was Eight Eyed Spy. Probably. That's more like it. You're just going to wait for things to come and you're just going to do your career? Or do you have any other grand plan designs that you're going to reveal? No, I have no musical designs. Um, I, what I wish that I was paying the bills with was acting because I've done a handful of movies. Yeah, and, tell okay, us how you got into that. That's, that's, that's what, what you're doing I mean, you're now. Here, you got to get an agent or are you going to actually see it through? I have an agent and a manager. Well, that's not true. Uh, my agent just lost his job about two weeks ago. 
And I guess he took you with him down that slide. He wants to have me wherever he ends up. Go, which could be the gutter. Yeah. How did you even get into acting? And tell us about some of your recent projects with that. Well, I did. I did some of it in high school and college. And then when I was in Chicago, um, a filmmaker named Jim Sakura asked me to do a couple little things, which I did. And then and that, was, that was part of the impetus also for moving to L.A. Like, okay, I can do the key art here, and you know, I could do I can do some more acting. Because there's a lot of that goes on in Los Angeles. <laughs> Seems that way. Yeah. A lot of pretending um, going yeah. on here. A yeah, lot of fakery yeah. going on here. And, um, well, tell, tell us some of the so, projects you've been in. There was a movie that went to Sundance called I Don't Feel at Home in This World Anymore. That's been and, pretty popular on the scene. Yeah, it's yeah. It's coming up with popularity. It didn't It didn't have a theatrical run, which is a bummer. But people know about it. And it, yeah. I think it's on Netflix now, isn't it? It is on Netflix. Well, and it won you, Sundance. What, it won Best Picture at Sundance. You're doing great. So what was your role in that? I played Marshall. I'm kind of like a, a bad guy. I play bad guys more than and anything so else. And you're so nice. I was having some makeup done, and the guy who was doing it said, uh, we'd been talking for a while, he said, David, you've confirmed my theory. And I said, yeah, I have. What's, what's that? And he goes, it's always the nice guys who play the assholes. Well, let me tell you, my theory about women is they want a nice guy that knows how to act like an asshole. They get an asshole that pretends they're a nice guy. Boing. So I, maybe you're the perfect man after all. Probably. I kind of knew that from the beginning. I'm just saying. What was the last thing that you were uh, featured? That's great that it went to Sundance and won the award. Though. I think That's the last cool. one also was at Sundance called Dinner in America, where I have just a small, a short, a small role as a band manager, kind of a prick. I had a mustache <laughs> and everything. Ooh, you, that can't look good on you. Yeah, and Did then you have there to was paint really, it on. No, I growed it all on my Oof. own. Actually, I'd grown a beard, and then I shaved off the beard and left the mustache because, you know, it's pretty hard to walk around with a mustache. Ugh, or a beard. Well, depends what neighborhood you're in, but yeah. There was this artist in New York, Andy Soma, who at one point did this art project that I thought was very bold, where he, he had a full head of hair, but he decided to shave it into a comb-over for yeah. a year to realize how people treat you so differently according to your hair. And people treated him like a fucking creep, and he wasn't. I once walked down Hollywood Boulevard, put on a long white Lady Godiva wig, walked out, the whole world changed. Like, suddenly, you're a blonde, and people are noticing something else. Hair makes all the difference. So does well, mustache. Well, yeah, what, your whole get-up, the way you look. Like, well, I did another movie called Under the Silver Lake, where I played, um, the character's name is The Homeless King. <laughs> the Homeless King. A homeless guy, and I had grown a full beard, and they made me, I was dirty, dirty, dirty. My skin looked like black Ash. leather. Oof. So, and we were shooting in Griffith Park. I had some time to kill, so I just went walking around amongst people. See how the people treat and, you. And boy, oh boy, I tell you what, man, fathers grabbing, pulling their daughters closer. And, well, they you should know, do that oh, when they well, see you well, anyway, but it was, I'm just it was like It was very much a social experiment. Yeah. yeah. And imagine I mean, doing that for a year with a, with a bad comb over when you got full hair. I mean, that was a very brave art project. I mean, when kids, I puked in a Miami airport once uh, after not sleeping and going nuts for a weekend. The parents were definitely pulling the kids away from from uh, me. <laughs> me. Well, I had I had a puke. I had a puke in the recycling bin. That was, it was the only. Your pants. I, I, was, I was like, okay, do I go through security and maybe puke then? I was like, you know what? Let's just get it over with now. And I went over to the uh, recycling bin. It all came out. Got through security. Sh- sat in my chair. Shut my eyes and it's like, welcome to New York. Just total blackout the whole way. It's like a month ago. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a year ago. But, but whoever sat next to me, definitely that was a. I, I, yeah, they probably didn't smell so good. Vom voms. Do you like living in Los Angeles? I love it. I love this town. The weather's great. The architecture's good. Well, it's weird. When I first moved here, people complained like there's not much architecture in They're not LA, looking but, in the right places. Well, it's, it's in, I know. It, t- tons of Spanish shit that's cool as hell. So and lots of crafts and stuff. Hancock Park. And I live in gorgeous. Altadena. Which is sort of right by the mountains, and it's it's very quiet, and and people who bitch about California or Los Angeles don't know what they're talking about because they come to Hollywood for a weekend and they think they know L.A. Well, I lived in L.A. twice. I mean, I lived here in the early '80s for two years, and I lived in Venice Beach and Highland Park, and then I lived in Glendale for four years in the early '90s. And the thing is, L.A. is just a very unusual place. There is no center. It's very weird. Friendship is strange here. People are praying to a dead star on the sidewalk. It's a massive, ugly sprawl, and then there's great amounts of nature and beauty in the architect scattered all over. It's what you make it. You can be at the ocean, and 20 minutes later, be in downtown, and 20 minutes later, be a snow-covered mountain. And 20 minutes Amazing. later, you can be in Inglewood. Every city, I don't care where it is, how bumfuck it is or how big, there are, there are cool pockets of things, whether it's the nature. 
culture, whether it's the architecture, whether it's the people, whether it's the absence of all of the above, and you got to make it for yourself. It's like every place is what you make it. There is no golden grade or other because you can go anywhere and it can still suck because you fucking suck. Consider my body a hotel where many monsters live. I'm comfortable everywhere, but are you comfortable with me? I'm just asking. Are you, David? Are you comfortable with her? I'm just saying. He's very comfortable with me. Yeah, yeah, for He's sure. He's got no issue with me. Yeah. We like, we didn't, haven't even met that many times, but every time we do, it's just like, we know. I think we met when we, I'd played, when we played with the buttholes at Danceteria. I think we met there. What? And I think, I think the next time was Minehead. Doesn't matter. I feel like I've known you. Well, there's certain aspects that we share that we don't have. We don't even need to enunciate or elucidate on because it could just be me imagining. Maybe I'm just painting part of me onto you. Maybe. Or maybe I feel that you can sneak in under my pillow anytime you want, but be careful because I do carry a gun. So let me ask you: What, what did your military dad think of just your life and and your rock and roll ways? Was he was he? Totally- that's a that's a really cool question, Tim, because. When I got into the punk rock, my dad and I were not getting along. Like there was, there was one Christmas Eve, I was at my folks' house. My dad was off somewhere, and I said to my mom, "What time do you want me to be here tomorrow?" And she started crying, and she goes, "David, dear, your your father doesn't want to see you tomorrow on Christmas." And, wow, it's um, heavy. Yeah, that's and, a, that's a and, tough one, right? and we, I hated him, and How he old hated were you? me. Uh, probably twenty or twenty-one. Okay, and um, what, what, so what? You you hated him for probably some different rebellious ways. I mean, rebellious it, ways, and and he was con- very conservative and okay. stuff. And then uh, like also, I I was I sort of got homeless and had to kind of move back home. And I was in that f- first Toxic Shock band when I played bass, and I'd written these words that my mother found. She was cleaning my room, and she found these words like where I'd said that I wished my father would die so I could get his money and blah blah blah. And so I came home one day, and everything I'd ever given my mother was on my bed. And she's, That's heavy. Yeah, and she said, you know, I saw this stuff, and she said, David, I've seen The Exorcist, but I didn't know anything that evil existed. Well, you know what? I mean, and and did you form a peace, or was that just kind of a, a, was that a, div- a divorce with your parents at that point? You never looked back, did you? Well, I I tried to explain to my mom that it's it was sort of tongue in cheek, you know. And my mom and I, our friendship remained always. But then my dad and I, we just couldn't get along. And then, but then he he was he had retired from the air force and he was flying airlines. Right. One night he was take, fixing to take off, and his co-pilot said, "Frank, you're too drunk to fly." And so they said, "Okay, either you go to rehabilitation or you're fired." What year and was so, that? Uh, Nineteen. It kind of matters because the protocols on this thing's changed throughout 80, the years. Nobody wants a drunken pilot. No, no, I know. 80, 86? Wait, do you know what airline he was working for? I don't. I don't it, was, it, was, it was little. It was really little. He called it TWA, but it was Teeny Weeny Airlines. So, so, so what did he choose? Rehab or, or did he? He, he, went, he went and uh, quit drinking. And he became, became the guy that my mom married, the open-minded, free-thinking, wonderful artist. Who, he was an artist. He, was, he couldn't decide when he was in school. He either wanted to be an artist or a fighter pilot. And he chose fighter pilot and went to vi- Vietnam and killed a thou- million people, you know. Um, did that inspire then, his art? But, did murder uh, inspire your dad's art? Or did it inspire your music? Everything. He became the, a good guy again. And so for the last 13 years of his life, we were friends. And so he would come to see the Jesus Lizard. And we got sued by this girl in t- Texas when I threw a beer in the audience. She same, claimed it hit her and caused permanent damage. And was, we had to go to court. My mom and dad both took the stand. And it was so great. It I mean, was so full great. Circle, they, they, you're, you're being asked not to go to Christmas because you're punk, punk rock ways, and here they are t- on the stand defending yeah. your ways. Yeah, my dad's very, he was very articulate, and he was very smart and very clever. And so their ambulance-chasing shit-ass uh, lawyer said to my dad, so retired Lieutenant Colonel Frank Lam- Lambeth, yeah, are you proud of your son? And when my dad was really serious, he'd grit his teeth <laughs> and do this, and he, go, and he gritted his teeth and he goes, 
Yes, I am. Oh, this is like a and, movie. Uh, man, <laughs> it was so fucking great. It was so great. And I was just like looking at them going, you're fucking with the wrong people. Yeah, like you're, you're dawn <laughs> at that point. Yeah. And, and was it jury, were there any tears in the jury, jury box? <laughs> well, that was great. There were, there were several blue hairs in there. And so yeah. when, I was, when, I was, when I was on the stand, he said, the lawyer said to me, um, so what are you good at? Because I think he'd read interviews where I'm self-deprecating. So he thought maybe I would just be self-deprecating. But I said, well, my wife thinks I'm a good cook. I've written a few lines that I'm pretty proud of, and I don't know anyone who can beat me at Scrabble more than I can beat them. And these little old ladies in the in the jury oh, just going, "Isn't he adorable? Oh, look at him go!" Oh, well, you, well, so you, Did it matter to you that your dad <laughs> said that, whether he was serious or not? Did you want your dad's approval? Oh yeah, Jesus, why? He loved his dad. I know, I, I but loved, still, I was so proud of him. He was my hero because he killed a lot of people. No, because he was an artist and a and a fighter jet pilot. Uh huh. <laughs> I understand that. Yeah, I'm just asking. I'm glad he turned out to be a good man. Well, you, and you were proud of him. Well, that story, besides things like TV movies, that doesn't usually happen. And so the fact that you guys could come full yeah, circle, they're... you know, there he is. At least in my little interpretation, based on what you told me, cracking the whip of order and discipline, and then he finds himself on the fu- against the, the fucking wall with his drinking, and that can go in many different directions. There is a yeah, point where most I, parents do become the babies that their children have to take care of, though. That's what always I think is just ridiculous. Anyway. Yeah, that that didn't happen. Well, he was an alcoholic. He had to go to rehab. At least he took had the good sense of going to rehab. Yeah. So you didn't have to babysit and change his fucking diapers. So were there a couple years after his rehab, or is it kind of that turbulent, no pun intended with the pilot thing, but uh, that kind of turbulent uh, transition? Or did he, you know, I know I know a little bit of these apologies. Did he contact you in the middle of that? Or how, well, did, how did you come back? Or your mom said, come in, you your know, dad part wants of, to talk to you? Part of their program is making amendments yes, to totally. like, people. Honestly, I mean, he did apologize to me, but I don't know that he ever really went through as well as he should have with me. I know that he was a really good sponsor and had a shit ton of, like, sponsees. Oh, a lot, look, a lot of parents are better with other people than they are with their own children. And that's sure. another reason to not procreate. I think that's pretty common. That is a reason absolutely to not procreate. First of all, I mean, parents, nobody teaches you how to be one. So therefore, don't do it and try to learn from the mistakes your parents made. That's one thing. Other thing is parents become their own, they become babies at a point. If they live too long, they become the babies you got to take care of. You didn't have a baby, now you got parents that are babies. That's another problem. Nobody writes the script for this. There's no perfection. There's no ideal situation. Parents are often disappointing. They're abusive. They're neglecting. They're alcoholic. They're drunk. They're drug addicts. They die. Why the fuck do we have them? Oh, yeah, that's the only way we got here. This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and David Yao. 